Welcome to the Radix Review. Tune in each week as co-hosts Jay Denton and Chris Nebenzal cover the key trends in the apartment industry, macroeconomy, and much more. And welcome back. Today is June 6th. I'm Chris Nebenzal, joined by Jay Denton. Jay, what are we seeing in the market this week? Chris, this week we're going to talk about the May results. So we just wrapped up month two of prime leasing season. I know you're going to dig in on the overall national metrics, but a couple markets that really stood out to you. First Friday is this month. So for those who aren't familiar, the first Friday of every month or just about the first Friday of every month, the national jobs report is released. And so we'll talk about what we're expecting there. You've been following some other economic headlines that could point to a little bit slower growth as we head towards the back part of this year. You're from the Boston area originally. I'm from Dallas, so we can't help with the NBA finals with those two cities meeting up. We got to find some way to talk about it. So let's uh, let, let's go ahead and start off with the apartment market uh, sector. So Chris, give us a flavor for what happened in May. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, so we just wrapped up the month of May. Overall, May was a good month. I would say we saw typical growth in the in the areas that we expected to see growth, occupancy and rent. Interestingly enough, we didn't really see much activity on the traffic and leasing side. We've talked a lot about traffic uh, perhaps peaking at a lower level than what we've seen in years previous. And really, traffic was flat for the month of May at around 8.2 tours per property on average nationwide. Leasing similarly at about 2.7 tours, excuse me, 2.7 leases signed per property nationwide. So not a whole lot of movement in the traffic and leasing and those leading indicators that we wanted to see, but steady growth in occupancy. Occupancy was up about 11 basis points as it climbs back towards that magic 94 number that you and I have talked about in the past. Uh, And rent was up about 40 basis points. So overall, a decent month of May, a steady month of May, but not quite the performance that a a lot of us were expecting and a lot of us were looking for. Uh, Now at the market level, the, the markets that really outperformed were smaller markets, uh, smaller markets specifically in the Southeast and Southwest, places like Wilmington, Colorado Springs, Charleston, uh, San Antonio had a good month. San Antonio has been a market that has struggled quite a lot over the past couple of years. Albuquerque, another good month from, from an occupancy perspective. Um, from a traffic perspective, similar, similar trend. Uh, we see a lot of activity uh, in some of those smaller markets, Chattanooga picked up a lot of traffic. Greenville, South Carolina picked up a lot of traffic. Reno had a strong month from a traffic perspective. So I know we've talked a lot about Boston, DC, Chicago, and those were some of the best performing markets uh, last year and still do maintain pretty good uh, activity uh, from a year over year perspective. But certainly in the month of May, we saw outperformance uh, in the smaller markets, especially in the Southeast. Now, looking at at rent as well, um, markets like San Jose actually had the best performance uh, in in the country. Rents were up 2.5% in San Jose last month. But then again, it's a lot of small markets. Huntsville, Alabama, Wilmington, North Carolina, again, uh, Minneapolis, uh, not a small market by any stretch, but not the biggest market in the the Midwest. So overall, I'd say the, the smallest markets Um, or the smaller markets were the ones that outperformed. Now we're going to roll out a new segment uh, this week called Market of the Month. We'll do this the first week of every month where we look at kind of all the metrics that we're tracking and and say, what market was the, was the one that, that outperformed. Uh, And this month it, it goes to Wilmington, North Carolina. So Wilmington, North Carolina, again, really, really strong uh, performance fundamentals. Occupancy was up about 60 basis points in May. Rent was up about 1.5% for the small North Carolina market. Uh, And Wilmington isn't a market that we've talked a lot about recently. Typically, we've been talking about Raleigh, Charlotte, some of their supply challenges, steady demand, but but the oversupply. Interestingly enough, Wilmington uh, doesn't have as heavy of a supply wave coming online, but demand remains really, really strong in Wilmington. So uh, we give uh, Wilmington our our first market of the month, really, really strong performance uh, for that city last month. Now, Jay, I know you've uh, you've looked at Wilmington in the past. Any additional color you can provide for Wilmington? Yeah, first shout out to the people of Carolina Beach in Wilmington. When I lived in uh, North Carolina, it used to be one of my favorite places to take the family. A lot of fun there. Uh, there was another article came out. I, I thought it was interesting that, that this one popped out to you as you were reviewing. 
just so happened over the weekend, I was uh, reading just, you know, various articles out there and one popped up that uh, highlighted data from pods. So, you know, a lot of times early, the early part of the year, the U-Haul report comes out and it's been coming out for a while of where people are moving and so on. Well, the company pods, if people are familiar with, they just come, I think, deliver like a big container in front of your house and you put all your stuff and they move it somewhere. And they ranked for, I think it ended it in March, maybe for the prior year that where they saw the most movement. And I think they tracked like 80,000 um, different pod movements. Wilmington was number one and it's been number one for the last two years. Now, there may be some regional bias in there. I'm, I'm not really sure, but just found it interesting that some of these companies that are tracking other types of demand factors ranked Wilmington up there as well. Now, I know another one I, that you had mentioned, if there was a number two you were going to highlight, San Jose, you just posted something on LinkedIn, comparing, contrasting San Jose and San Francisco. I followed up with a little bit of, you can also look at the concession data and how San Jose's you know, not showing the types of concessions that, that San Francisco is showing. Just and that's, a, again, another one of those demand indicators we, we track to see what are operators having to offer to, to fill the units and so on. But what did you see on San Jose? Anything extra to highlight there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would give San Jose the honorable mention for, for market of the month. I, I know we, uh, we probably have to stick with one, but San Jose was, was right there behind Wilmington. Really, really strong growth. And, and interestingly enough, San Jose has kind of run under the radar a little bit. Uh, rent, as I mentioned, was up 2.5% in the month of May alone. Traffic is among the highest in the nation. We typically think of the high traffic markets like Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, Nashville. Uh, but San Jose is in there as well, 10.3 tours per property. Again, comparing that to San Francisco, traffic is almost double what we're seeing in San Francisco. Now, San Francisco includes the Oakland market as well. So not only the peninsula, but the East Bay. And there are some challenges in the East Bay and in the peninsula. Uh, but, but again, when we look at that South Bay metro in San Jose, really, really good operating activity. Uh, occupancy is above 95.5%, which again, compared to the rest of the country, is, is one of the best. Rent growth and overall rents are strong. And as you mentioned, the concession activity, uh, only about $78 on average per month uh, of concessions in the South Bay area, which given how expensive rents are, that's a really, really uh, comfortable and strong place to be from a concession perspective. So yeah, San Jose uh, certainly gets the honorable mention for, for market of the month. And it's something that I'll be keeping my eye on more and more. You know, a lot of what we hear is the, the decline in the Bay area, the decline in Northern California. I don't think we can really talk about the decline in Northern California anymore I think we have to isolate that to the East Bay and the peninsula. Sacramento is doing really well. San Jose is clearly doing well. Reno is doing well. So Seattle is another market that's doing well. And, and oftentimes we see out migration from the Bay Area to Seattle. So the, the decline story, I think, is really isolated to the East Bay and to the peninsula. Some of the surrounding markets just as close as the South Bay are doing quite well. So Jay, moving forward beyond uh, kind of the multifamily market, what are you seeing in terms of the job numbers? Uh, I know, as you mentioned, we'll get first Friday job numbers this month. We're almost at the halfway point of the year. What do you think is, is going to happen in the employment market? Always a fun report for me when it gets released each month, just to see, you know, where jobs are being added, not location wise, but industry type. So like we just mentioned, you know, we're talking about the Bay Area and the types of jobs really matter. You know, are they tech jobs or other types that we're, we're seeing across the country? Uh, you know, last month, it, I guess it was a shock when, when you know, monthly job gains had, had dropped from 300K plus down to 175. You know, a deceleration was expected. It seemed like the, it, was, it was a lot, uh, a lot slower of a, uh, job growth month than, than people had anticipated. So for this month, expectations are now about the same as where they were, were for the actuals of last month. So somewhere in like the 175 to 185,000 range is what I'm seeing generally out there from what economists are predicting. Look, if, if it can keep that pace long-term, you know, from, from now through the end of the year and beyond, it, things will be fine. Like that's, that's actually the type of number we have been projecting since the beginning of the year. So not too concerned if it comes in at that range. I think the thing that I will be watching, we've mentioned it several times here, a lot in the, uh, you know, the different client visits and webinars that we have, again, the types of jobs being added, the industries adding jobs. Right now, healthcare has been carrying 
uh, the bag for for quite a while. And so at some point, you know, healthcare might slow down too. So just seeing a little bit more widespread job growth is something that would love to see. Expectations around wage growth. So we track multifamily. If, if, if wages, you know, aren't increasing at a decent pace, it can be tough for rents to also uh, increase. Wage growth is still projected so far. What people are thinking around 3.9%. I believe that's what it was at last month. I think it'll edge closer to three and a half by the end of the year. So if you think about that, wages increasing about three and a half percent. At some point, rents are probably going to go up closer to that number. You know, the, the better performing markets that they're they're around that number. So if it can keep up, jobs keep up, supply is going to slow. I think it's more about it's almost. I mean, we're almost at the end of leasing season. That sounds crazy to say, but for this year, so really looking for the trajectory of how things are going to shape up in the fall and then into next year. Uh, one more note that I'll add. So not the first Friday report for job creation for April, but uh, numbers were just released over the last week also on the number of job openings and things like how many people are quitting their jobs. Uh, I don't get too excited over the month to month changes because just the methodology don't get too worked up over those. But it was an important note that that in in March uh, or, or might have been April, uh, whichever number was being reported there, there were eight point one million uh, jobs open as of the latest month that was being reported. So about eight one eight eight point one. That's the lowest since February of twenty twenty one. So we're seeing companies open up fewer and fewer jobs. Uh, not exactly what you want to see. And I know you're about to touch on some other indicators that, that you're following. The other interesting one in there would be the, the quits. How many people are quitting their job month to month? What I found, uh, it made sense. But when, it, when, I, when I joined you here at Radix and we started digging into you know, some of these different trends, notice that, that the number of people quitting their jobs is 80% correlated with the trends in occupancy rates. So if more people quit their jobs, occupancy rates go up, which might sound strange, but when people quit their jobs at a higher level or a higher pace, it tends to tell you that the economy is doing better. People are more confident in switching jobs. They're probably getting a nice raise or pay increase, which is one of the reasons that they're, they're leaving. So quitting sounds bad. It's actually a good thing for multifamily and tends to create more households and a better occupancy rate overall. So uh, look for a LinkedIn article from me pretty soon coming out on, on that topic. Now, I mentioned some things on job creation, but there are other metrics out there uh, that I know we follow. I know that you follow that are starting to get a little bit more in a, in a concerning zone, or at least they're, they're trending in a way that you would hope they wouldn't. So what are some of those that other metrics, Chris, that you're following? Yeah. And, and as economists, I think we always like to uh, look for the dismal news. You know, many people refer to this, this study as the dismal science, but um, we've had such a strong economy over the past couple of years that, that I think now we're starting to see some indications of that slowdown. When the Fed first started to raise rates and everyone started to panic about how quickly they were raising rates, a lot of people said we're going to go into a recession quickly. Now, obviously, we haven't done that. Um, and I'm not predicting a recession quite yet. Uh, but there are some indicators that are starting to show signs of, of softening. Uh, now, GDP, obviously, is kind of a standard for the overall economic growth. GDP has been surprising uh, many economists on the upside with how strong it's been. 2%, 3%, really, really strong growth in 2022, 2023. Now, the the GDP from the first quarter to the second quarter of this year has uh, has slowed down tremendously. It's still positive. Uh, growth is about 1.3, 1.4% annualized in the second quarter, down from 3.5% in the first quarter. But that slowdown is, is meaningful. So certainly GDP is something I'm keeping my eye on. We'll get one more estimate of the second quarter GDP, um, excuse me, the first quarter GDP uh, before this quarter ends. And then we'll start to see second quarter GDP uh, released in July. Uh, but but GDP is is a concerning area for me. The other metric that I've been uh, focusing on is the manufacturing indexes, uh, ISM in particular. Uh, ISM is an in index that looks at overall manufacturing output and capacity in, in the US. Anytime it goes below 50, that indicates a contraction. Uh, the past couple of months, we've been in the 48, 49 uh, range so not not tremendously below uh, that kind of high water not the high water mark but the the standard mark for expansion and contraction um, but overall we are seeing a slowdown in manufacturing 
Now, this is crucial, especially because we've talked over the past couple of years about the importance of the CHIPS Act, the importance of bringing high-end manufacturing back to the United States, things like electric vehicles, batteries, microchips, solar panels. Um, and, and the slowdown in manufacturing is a concern given how much uh, investment we've put into that side of, of our economy. So the ISM manufacturing index is something that I'm focusing on as well. And then the 10-year treasury, again, that's a, a crucial um, metric for our industry. A lot of the financing for multifamily and, and single family homes are tied to the 10-year treasury. Uh, we've seen the 10-year treasury drop about 35 basis points in the past week. Now that's a pretty meaningful drop. Uh, good news if you're looking for a mortgage or if you're look at, looking to purchase a home. Uh, but that that gauge tells me that there's more concern in the economy, uh, perhaps more optimism of a rate cut uh, in the third quarter or fourth quarter. Um, but the fact that that 10-year that treasury yield is coming down so quickly, that tells me that there's a lot of concern in the underlying facets of the economy. So as you mentioned, Jay, first Friday jobs, that'll be the next indicator that we watch closely. But again, going forward, we'll be watching GDP. We'll be looking at the inflation numbers as, as well as we certainly do. We'll be monitoring the Fed. Uh, but I'm starting to see a couple cracks form. Now, again, not uh, an immediate recession indicator, uh, and we might not even see a recession period, but more of a slowdown economically that I think a lot of people have been predicting uh, for quite a while. So Jay, uh, kind of moving forward, I, I know you mentioned the the NBA Finals. Um, it's fun to to talk sports and economics and multifamily in our wild card. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a big Boston sports fan. You're a Dallas guy. Um, so what parallels can you draw between the the Dallas multifamily market and the Mavericks, and perhaps the Boston multifamily market and the Celtics? And what can you tell us about who's going to win the finals? I'll, I'll let you cover the Boston part. So for, for Dallas, I would say that uh, exciting. If I think about the, uh, the Mavericks, they they score a lot. Dallas adds a lot of jobs, you know, so there's this, that, that like fun component to it. But no one really expected the Mavericks to be here. I mean, they're good. They're a good team, much like Dallas, a good multifamily market. But no one really expected the Mavericks to be in the situation that they are now playing in the finals, even though they have two great, really uh, big superstars <laughs> So I don't know. I was thinking like the cheesiest, you know, comparison I could make. Basically, uh, no one expected the Mavs to be there. And hey, no one expects Dallas to absorb all this supply ever, but it's going to. So don't worry. It'll be fine. Uh, give it give, give it a little bit of time and, and we'll be OK. What about if you think about Boston, any sort of parallels that you can think of? Yeah. So without sounding too much like a like a Homer and a Bostonian, you know, the Celtics have been dominant for the for the better part of this year, they've had a really good run. Um, Boston multifamily has been performing very, very well. Uh, occupancy is up. Rent growth uh, is up. Boston was one of the first markets to emerge with positive rent growth last year and has really been dominating uh, the the key multifamily metrics for much of the much of the past nine to 12 to 18 months. So, you know, Boston is, has been dominant. The, the Celtics certainly have been the favorites for much of this postseason, even going back uh, before the postseason. Um, they've got a lot of star power as well. They, they've got um, Jason Tatum. They've got Jalen Brown. They've got a ton of uh, role players who have been stars in their, in their previous uh, aspects of their career. Boston also has a lot of really, really strong submarkets. Uh, we were looking at the Boston data a couple of weeks ago. And none of the Boston submarkets were seeing negative rent growth. Uh, so really a, a well, diversely talented market, both from a basketball perspective and a multifamily perspective. I realize now we're, we're stretching this a little bit, but uh, yeah, just to, just to tie that up, I, I don't see how the Celtics lose this series. Uh, I don't see any softness in the Boston market moving forward. Uh, really, really strong market, stable market. Continued growth from you know from a high end job perspective, high talented players, and so I see a a bright and long runway for both the Celtics and the Boston multifamily market. Hopefully, uh, the Celtics can get it done and Boston continue to be strong in terms of multifamily. I I feel like you picked this topic because your city is going to come out ahead uh, one way or another, but that's that's okay to be seen. We'll we'll see. But on multifamily, I think certainly this is the year for for Boston relative to Dallas, no doubt about it. 
And, and Dallas does have a strong core again, both in both in basketball and multifamily. I wouldn't bet against uh, Dallas over the next five years. You mentioned the job growth, the population growth. Uh, I wouldn't bet against Luca and Kyrie having a, a good, strong team going forward as well. So, uh, yeah, I think two really strong multifamily markets, uh, one more of a performing now, one more of a performing down the road. Um, but I, I think both markets are in good shape. So enough with the with the uh, cheesy basketball and multifamily comparisons. Jay, anything else uh, to add for for this week's pod? No, just looking forward, you know, June, we'll see how the metrics shape up. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting them every single week. So every, it's like every Monday, I'm so excited when the new numbers come out and we're going to hit 94% at some point, Chris, I promise it's going to happen some, sometime soon. It, it could be as soon as next week. We've seen occupancy picking up about two, three basis points a week and we're about three basis points away. So I imagine uh, kind of by mid, late June, we'll be back in that 94% range. And then we'll just see how long occupancy can kind of stay, stay where it is. Typically, we, the third quarter is where occupancy starts to level off and then fall. Um, so we've been, we've been working back to that 94% level. It would not surprise me and, and our forecasts show that it'll drop back down below 94% by the end of the year. Um, it'll just be interesting to, to watch how long that occupancy can stay steady before it begins to decline this year. Well, thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Radix Review. Uh, on behalf of Jay Denton, I'm Chris Nebenzal. Thanks again to everyone for your support and for listening.